So after my crazy all-night Greyhound adventure to Arizona, I got to Phoenix and finally the race is going on. So it's day one. Didn't sleep a whole lot the night before, but it's exciting being out there on the race course with all the legends. And right from the start, you know, Joe Fegis and uh, Giannis Karras were definitely in a battle. And it was just like a heavyweight boxing match just going on for 144 hours. Um, they were both laser focused, just putting in their laps. It was difficult kind of to really see what was going on with that race because, like I said, even though I've not done very many up to that point looped races, so this one had a lot of people, one mile loop, but there was quite a lot of traffic, especially when we wound through the twisty turny part in the baseball diamonds. You know, it's a wide path, but pretty much, and there's room, you know, it's like eight foot wide, probably plenty of room for people to pass you. And so, you know, I was just basically doing probably 16, 17 minute miles walking along, biding my time because I knew it was going to be a long haul and my goal was to get to 300. And so I'm just kind of cruising along, doing my thing, and we've got tons of 24 hour people and 48 and 72. And especially 24 hour people, they always go out really super fast and are flying around. The weather was beautiful, perfect conditions, kind of like what it is out here today in Bakersfield. That's why I think I did well in Phoenix because the weather is very similar. Sunny and cool during the day, but warm enough that it was always kind of funny. I always say that I like doing these races, especially like there at across the years, because um, especially with like the women, it was like having like two or three times the field in the race because early in the morning everyone's all bundled up later on gals are out there running in sports bras and shorts and then at night they're bundled up again so it's like had like outfit changes almost like you were in a play or something so they were all flying around joe and um, um Giannis were moving along you know probably they're six miles an hour or so but compared to the 24-hour people, they weren't flying along. Neither of them really running along with people. Um, generally, Joe doesn't run with people. Um, he has hearing aids, so often having conversations with him uh, is difficult. And then uh, Giannis definitely wasn't very talkative that first day. He didn't seem too happy. I guarantee the dust was bothering him. The people in the way didn't seem to bother him. I never saw him being really upset or annoyed by them, but I'm sure that was an inconvenience too, because the man, as I saw later, is a master at cutting the tangents. And Yes, race tactics I was speaking of before I got cut off there. Yes, uh, Kuros would definitely cut the can tangents. It's something I've always been confused when I watch runners run, how even really good athletes run wide around turns and do all kinds of stuff like that and run a lot of extra distance. You know, and of course, like I said, Kuros and his people the night before went around and walked the course and measured the tangents and checked out things so that he knew how far he needed to run. And it's always amazing to me how some people don't do that. I learned it way back in 79 when I first started running, um, especially in cross country in the, the following fall, that you just, you know, want to run the course, you know, legally and ethically, but you want to run it as short a distance as possible. And I've done very well in races. So Curtis and said, Curtis and Joe are out there going along, a couple other people <laughs> in the sixth day, they would later on have an epic battle for third place. Of course, Joe and Giannis were going for first, was Ed the Jester Eddinghouse, good friend of mine from Southern California, who I've done many, many, many miles with over the years. And then there was William Scheifel, who was an age group record, and Ed was probably in his, he was around 50-ish or late 40s, and uh, yeah, I guess he was probably, four, I was 40 nine seven eight years ago yeah so he was around that same age and then william is also a very good age group runner owns tons of world records from scotland later on he actually finished that 3100 mile race in new york city as well so they had an epic battle as well which i'll talk about so the first day it would be kind of nice if it was just the six day people out there then it would have been kind of fun but having the other people was a good distraction because even though I hadn't done a real six day race, I knew I needed to just, you know, turn my brain off. I often say, put it into <coughs> save mode, like how computers, you just have that um, mode where you're sleep mode and you're just trying to rack the miles up and just keep moving whatever possible. So I just kind of watched the goings on, watched the race, watched the fast people go by. One of the things that struck me immediately when I first started a race was um, I had started wearing Hoka's a few years before that and I liked the shoes. They really helped me in trail running and helped me in long races with the big cushioning and um, saved my feet and helped me. My first 100 I did on the roads of Los Angeles in 2011, I ran ASIC shoes with cotton socks and my feet were destroyed. Uh, I had that a lot. Probably the reason I was able to finish those 50 mile races in the mountains was because of Hoka, because the whole thing about Hoka when they first start out, they were nice and wide, so your feet felt comfy. They had a lot 
lot of cushioning and they, you know their whole motto was so you can fly and the guys who developed them were french guys who wanted to recreate downhill skiing on trail running and so they wanted a shoe that they could just fly down hills and the shoes definitely helped me on the downhills because i'm pretty slow and bad at it. i'm like a big mac truck going down a hill in first gear so i was glad to have them so i had my uh, hokas i had found smart wall socks before that so i often wore those and it was a decent pair and i ended up wearing those hokas the entire time but on the first lap or two all of a sudden i see people and this is 2013 2014 people running by in these shoes that were wide kind of like hokas but they're completely flat and i had no idea what they were and they were ultras and even though my friend scott newton owns a shoe store just hadn't heard about ultras in fact he didn't get them in stock till march or april that year but one i watched him i like i like that shoe the big white toe box the no uh, you know lift on them the no heel and the other thing i noticed was that many of the arizona people all ran beautifully i've seen jamil run and ian Nick, his brother Nick, I don't know why I always want to see Ian Curry, and they had this just beautiful flowing run, and it's kind of like that Arizona Phoenix style, and I noticed many of the athletes running with that, you know, you know, high cadence, perfect running form, body center over their butt, you know, their the weight over their feet, um, you know, just running kind of like a barefoot style, but not running barefoot or in the silly sandals and stuff, and there were a couple of young ladies who were just floating around, probably in the 24, running that way as well. So that was a revelation that I was really interested to see those shoes. Um, of course, I was wearing my standard big baggy shorts that I usually buy from Big Five. And back then I wasn't wearing these REI shirts, I was wearing the Dickies, but with the collars and the pockets. I like having the pockets to keep stuff in. And then I also had every jacket I owned. Thankfully, I started hiking in the High Sierra. So I had puffy jackets, I had, um, a couple other you know rain kind of jackets i didn't have any long pants i did the whole race in shorts and after that first year there i'd been racing for almost 40 years without long pants the next year is that across the years i wore long pants what was also nice is being out of uh Air, of california for the first time really in a race um it was nice just to meet new people and of course the phoenix running scene is really big with Aravipa and um, all the East Coast people and people from around the world coming, especially since Kuros was there. And so it was nice to just see different people, new people, hear stories. That's when I first started hearing about Vol State, which I will later talk about how I actually signed up for the thing. And just, you know, John Price um, and uh, Mike Melton and so many other guys. Mike Melton now does the timing. Back then, uh, Aravipa was doing their own timing. Nick Curry had developed a program that was a really good program. Talking about the timing, I really liked that. They had some big TV screen monitors, and you know it was easy to read. And every time you crossed the line, almost instantaneously, you know you wouldn't have to go far. You could see where, you, what lap you were on, how you did, what your time was. And um, the six-day race, usually the colors seemed to correspond to our bibs. Six-day race had red, and so my name would be in red, so I could see Andy Noise and see my time and my distance. And that was very helpful and handy. You didn't have to stop. You didn't have to wonder. And it was also online, so you could actually have your phone out and be seeing that. And it was interesting. Later on, after I did the race, I would be at races in California and have people come up to me going, man, I was getting up in the middle of the night and refreshing and seeing how Kuros and Joe did, and seeing how you were doing, and we'd see you walking by the, the finish line and really, really enjoyed that. And it was kind of cool. And uh, so I love how we have this kind of coverage in these races. And it'd be so nice, like, someday to have even more. So kind of like how the Spartan races have with people running along, filming them, but, like, maybe put transponders on us like they do at Tahoe 200 where you can see people moving the entire time and turn a race. That would be a definitely an interesting thing to do. Spending six days, 144 hours with Kuros and Shvijas, one of the things I didn't really ever see them do very much was eat or drink. I know they must have, but you never really saw them doing that. So many other athletes, you see them constantly spending time doing that or um, just involved with it with their crew and stuff. And I'm not really sure. Like I said, you never really saw them walking around carrying bottles or food. They were just moving the entire time, especially on that first day. Myself, like I said earlier, I realized that, you know, you need to go run, walk through that aid station, which was completely doable, and just spy and see what was coming up. The race would have a bill, uh, a board saying what's coming up for breakfast, what's coming up for lunch, what's coming up for dinner, which would get, you know, give you some inspiration, have, you know, be like, oh, cool. Uh, myself, I didn't bring any food to the race. 
Um, so I pretty much was just winging it on whatever happened to be in the aid station. And man, I ate so many of those turkey and cheese sandwiches. And that's kind of what I survived on. And then of course, whatever they served at meals throughout the day. But it was interesting how I just never really noticed Joe or Giannis um, eating or drinking. I know they were they had to be putting in calories, putting in the amount of energy that they were doing it was phenomenal. Um, the other thing that was interesting watching is, you know, Joe is a very efficient, smooth runner. In fact, he pretty much, you never see, I've never almost seen him walking ever. He's either just running kind of that 10 minute, 12 minute miles, you know, five, six miles an hour, or he's taking a break. And he's got great statistician, Mike, doing crunching the numbers, and he goes out, does a certain distance, and then he's got time off. Kuros, I'm sure back in the day, I hear he just ran, <laughs> you know, eight, nine miles an hour forever and didn't stop. Um, he was a lot slower, but again, he was 57, and he didn't have a great form. I mean, he was smooth, but when you watch him, you didn't go, oh, you know, he's just floating along. He just kind of, like, looked like he was fighting the entire time, just this, you know, but, you know, you, you know, you could see he was a heart of a champion. He was really, you know, totally in a zone, but you never say, you know, he kind of almost shuffled, and I, you know, that probably led to his difficulties where, he was getting dirt and dust because he was making quite a bit of mess and fuss. But he was staying out there forever and as long as he could. And that's how I ended up getting to spend quite a bit of time with him late at night because he was out there trying to make up ground and stay close to Joe. Uh, myself, like I said, just kind of going along. At this time, I had a really bad habit of whenever I got to big mile markers like 50 miles, 100K, 100 miles, I'd get into a funk. And so the race starts at 9 in the morning, sometime I don't know, 16 hours in, maybe 11 or 12 o'clock at night. I'm getting close to 50 miles, but I'm a couple miles away, and those miles just dragged on. And I was in such a bad mood. A couple of my friends were trying to get me to keep moving. And they're like, you know, you got to get to 50 before you can take a break. And my buddy Bob Davison, you know, trying to get me to keep moving. And like I said, I finally got to it, and I was just so relieved. But it was such an ordeal. And then now I'm thinking, wow, that took me 16, 17 hours, and my goal is 300 miles. I got to do 50 a day. And the idea of that was not good. I went to the tent that they gave me there in the tent area and went in there and couldn't sleep. It was cold. It was miserable. I was too wired. But I told myself, oh, you know, I'm going to come in here and lay down for three or four hours. It was no noisy because I was by the aid stations and all that. That's why I learned later to be in the back parking lot. And so I didn't sleep. I did get some rest. And then finally later in the night, like one or two in the morning, it was just so damn cold that I just put on every single piece of clothing I owned and got back out there and did laps because, you know, it's like you can't sleep and, you know, it's, and you're cold. You might as well just put in miles. And so by the end of the day one, I'd gotten to 68 miles and I was pretty much thinking this is definitely going to be difficult. And so in the next episode, I'll talk about my day two meltdown and, uh, as always, stay healthy, be boring, not epic.